And uh, it's such a blessing that we have volunteers that are willing to, to take them and teach them about God's word. Amen. It's great when our little ones can grow up knowing God and his word. It's just, it's it's such a blessing. I, I was blessed when I was raised to grow up in a church and a family that really instilled those those lessons and those teachings in my life. And it's really important for shaping young people to to you lead them in the way of the Lord so they won't wander. Amen. So I'm just thankful for our volunteers that are able to to, to uh, teach them the lessons of, of the truth of the word of Jesus Christ. Amen. So we've been going through the book of Hebrews and last week we finished up with chapter two. And what we had kind of learned about last week, what we learned about last week was that chapter two uh, first off, it began with a warning, and it was a warning from uh, the author of Hebrews, who I still think is Paul. And the more I study this and the more I compare Hebrews writings to other writings in the New Testament, that, that Paul had a lot. If, if he didn't physically write it himself, he had a lot to do with the words and the message behind it. But we heard about, we read about this warning about not neglecting our faith lest we drift away. And we had kind of talked about how that, that drifting we can see in our personal lives, but also from generation to generation, how important it is to focus on Jesus. And the whole argument that's been building this whole time is how Jesus is this exalted being that's been greater than the angels. And we saw that in chapter one and in chapter two. But at the end of chapter two, we also saw this description of Jesus being made lower. For a while, he was made lower than the angels, and he he took on the form of a bondservant, that he came to earth to take on flesh and blood like his brethren. And I think it's awesome that, that Christ refers to us as his brothers. And because of Christ, we are a part of God's royal family. And we're going to kind of dig into this here a little bit more because we're going to start here in, in verse uh, chapter 3 of Hebrews. And if you begin right there in verse 1, we're going to hop right into it and it says, Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the holy call calling, or the partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus. Now, I want to park on this for just a second. Because it's such an amazing thing because of Christ's work as our high priest, as the one who was sent by God. You know that's what apostle means. It's the sent one. Christ was sent. He was an apostle of God because God the Father sent the Son into the world for his redemptive plans and purposes. He sent his Son into this world for us. And it's amazing that because he sent Jesus Christ into the world and because he sent him as the high priest of our faith, he is the anchor of our soul and the pioneer. In chapter 2, we read last year that, that Christ is the pioneer. He's the author, the prince, the, 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 the royal headship of our faith. He is the foundation of our faith. And because of that, we become brothers and sisters in what Hebrews calls here the heavenly calling. Because we are partakers in this heavenly calling, we are holy brothers, not just with Jesus Christ, which is such an amazing thing that we can be co-heirs with Christ, children of the living God, but we become brothers and sisters with one another. Now, there's, it's, it's real easy as, as, as we walk through life it's easy to oftentimes find ourselves not dealing with one another in very brotherly fashions, in very brotherly ways. And, 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 and it's so important, and this is a theme that's constant throughout Scripture, about what brotherly love and what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. That love is, is, is an enduring thing. It doesn't bear false witness. It is forgiving. We, it's long-suffering. We're called to bear with one another in love because we are God's holy children. We are brothers and sisters in our great apostle and our high priest, Jesus Christ. He is the anchor of our soul, the pioneer of our faith. And because of that, we are called to be brothers and sisters with one another. Now, since Christ came like us to represent mankind before God, 
as our propitiation. We read about that. We read that word last week, uh, propitiation, which means to appease or to make pardon, to forgive. We have a pardon from our sins, from our trespasses in Jesus Christ because of the finished work that he did. Yet not I, but through Christ. It's what Christ did in us that we have forgiveness of our past sins. And because of that, we have become adopted children into the family of God. We're holy brethren. That means holy ones, saints, ones set apart for God. That is the believers of Christ's holy church that he established, that he inaugurated. That's, that's part, we're part of the kingdom of God here on earth. And we have this opportunity to join into that family and to be partakers and to live accordingly as brothers and sisters in Christ. But what does it mean to, to, to be a partaker in, the whole, in, in that heavenly calling? What does that look like? How does that live out? Well, you see, first of all, we have to always remember that Jesus should always be the anchor that anchors us to one another. See, in John, Christ spoke about being the vine, and we are the branches. We are of one essence in him. We are of one body in him. He's the one that's holding us together, church. And if we forget that, it's easy to slip into the garbage of the world and to get caught up in things that, that are meant to tear us apart. See, the enemy is very good at being an accuser and sending things our way to distract us from Jesus Christ. And the second our eyes get off of focus of Jesus and what he has done for us, we begin to split apart. So it's so important that we stay focused on the anchor of our soul, lest we drift away. So as brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, what does it mean? Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 4, he says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you, listen here, he uses the same kind of language, to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. This is the heavenly calling that God has given to each of us as partakers in that body. But what does he say? This is how we are called to walk as partakers in the heavenly calling. Ephesians, this is in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6, and it says, We are to walk with all loneliness or humble humility. We're to call to be humble before God and before others. And gentleness, not just loneliness, but gentleness. That's one of the fruits of the Spirit, right? That's the part of the Holy Spirit working in you that manifests these, these characteristics in you as you grow not only in your relationship with God and his word, but in your relationship with one another, in your love of one another, you will learn and you will let that gentleness grow. But it also says with long suffering, bearing with one another in love. Ladies and gentlemen, being a partaker, a brother of Christ, a co-heir in Christ, means that we are to treat each other we are to bear with them on another and always treat each other with brotherly kindness and above all else with love. See, because without love, everything else is meaningless. The greatest of these, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, he talks about how above all else, love is the one thing that's going to hold us together. Christ told his disciples before he left, he said that the world will know that you are my disciples. How? By your love for one another. But continue on in verse 3 of Ephesians, it says, uh, uh, bearing with one another in love, but also endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. For there is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. To be a partaker of God's heavenly calling, to be a brother and a co-heir in Christ, means to walk in love, in brotherly love, in kindness towards one another. And it's not because of what the other people do to us. 
we have a problem in our society where, where um, in, in growing up, I, I remember I, I remember listening to some songs. There were a lot of songs and the kind of music I listened to, and it was all about respect and respect is earned, and, and you got to treat. I'm only going to treat you this way if you treat me that way. But that is not what. God has called us to do. That is not the love of God that he has called us to share and bear with one another, is it? God's love is unconditional, and and that is the kind of love that we are called to share with one another. That's why Christ told his disciples that if someone persecutes you, to bless them. That if someone slaps you in the face, that you turn the other cheek. If they ask for your cloak, you give them your tunic. If they ask for you to walk a mile, you walk with them too. Because it's not about what they're giving to you and what they're doing to you, but what Christ has done in you. And as long as we stay focused on Jesus Christ, the anchor of our soul, the rock of our foundation, we should be living in brotherly kindness, in love with one another, keeping the unity in peace. Because regardless of what else comes along, we know that we are one in faith, one in Jesus, one in God. That is what it means to be a partaker of the heavenly calling. This is the reason why Jesus Christ can call us brothers. He calls us brothers. And even though we were mockers and scoffers, Scripture talks about how we were sinners and mockers and scoffers before we came to know him. And for no other reason, Christ died for us because he loved us. In this, while you were still sinners, disobedient children, Christ died for you. This is the same attitude, likewise the same attitude, the mind of Christ, the spirit of Christ that we should have with one another, bearing and being humble before one another, being gentle and kind, suffering and bearing with one another. This is so important to consider this because the body of Christ needs that. We need to be in one will with the Father, just like our brother, Jesus Christ, was of one will with the Father. Amen? See, Christ came into this world, sent by the Father, and he submitted himself to the point of death because he wanted He he willingly submitted to the will of the Father. Likewise, we need to submit ourselves to the will of God every single day by being a partaker, following the heavenly calling that God has called us to. And we can do this by considering the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus. Hopping back over into Hebrews now. See, partaking in the holy calling is remembering Christ in what he's done. Remembering that Christ was sent from the Father for our sins, to be our propitiation. See, we take it for granted sometimes that we have all these numbers and different chapters and verses and all these numbers and these sections and titles in our Bible. But when Hebrews was written, it was written as a whole piece, one letter. So there wasn't meant to be necessarily a distinct separation between the end of chapter 2 and the beginning of chapter 3. And you see it because the writer says, therefore, holy brethren. And the last thing he had just said, the thing he just got done saying was that, was that therefore in all things he had to be made like his brethren. Jesus had to be made like us, taking on flesh and blood, that he might be merciful and a, a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation or forgiveness for our sins, a pardon for our sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered, being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. Therefore, brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider what Jesus has done. Consider the things that Christ did for us, the lessons that he taught you during his time on earth. The, the, the word that he preserved for us to today. We need to consider these things in all that we do because of the finished work that he has done for us. Verse 2 of Hebrews, it says, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him, who appointed him as Moses, also was faithful in all his house. So up to this point, we've been seeing these comparisons made between Jesus Christ and angels. And we're going to continue to see these kind of comparisons 
that that is made between what God had pre what God had established that were meant to be shadows of the thing to come. And we're going to see how Christ fulfilled those things and was a better version of those things. Well, God had called Moses in the wilderness to deliver his people. He was a prophet, a mouthpiece of God during the times of Israel when they were in captivity in Egypt. But God called him to be his prophet and his mouthpiece to go into Egypt and to be his the, the one that God used to deliver the people from under Pharaoh's slavery. Now, so once again, now we begin to see this comparison of Jesus Christ and Moses as a prophet and a, a leader. Now, the Hebrews, the Israelites, the, the Jewish Christians, they, they, they esteemed Moses. Moses was a big deal to them, and he should be a big deal to us. Because of what he did and what he represented, it was God who gave his law and commandments to his servant Moses on Mount Sinai that we have. That's the reason we have the first five books of the Bible, right? If Moses, we believe that Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible, and that's the reason we have them today, because God chose Moses to do this. He was kind of a big deal because when Israel was in slavery and when they were in bondage, to their oppressors, who was Egypt, Egypt was the bad guy back then. They were the big bad guys. And they were in bondage. God called Moses to deliver them. He used Moses to deliver them. So he was, and, and he was called to lead the ch God's children of Israel into the promised land, this holy blessing that he had promised to Abraham long ago, Moses was, was the guy to do it, was the guy he chose to do it. So Moses was kind of a big deal. They esteemed him higher than a lot of the other prophets because of the works that he did and what he did. So now we begin to see that Hebrews is, is making this comparison of Jesus, of, of Jesus and Moses. We're going to see Christ's faithfulness as it compares to Moses' faithfulness. And you can see here it says, Who was faithful to him who appointed him, as Moses was also faithful in his house? For this one has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who built the house has more honor than the house. This idea this Moses was faithful in his house, this, this takes us back to a story in, in Numbers. In Numbers chapter 12. We find that the, the children of Israel are, are, are in the wilderness, and there's a point where uh, Aaron and Miriam begin to complain. Now, it, it's, it always amazes me, and maybe, maybe it's a little snobbery looking back on it because I wasn't there, so I don't know what the children of Israel were dealing with in the wilderness. But it always amazes me that the same people that watched God part the Red Sea that delivered them from the Egyptians through a series of plagues, led them out of bondage into the wilderness, was supplying them with food from heaven, with water from rocks, from, uh, from, was, was tabernacling with them, was coming down in a column of fire, in a cloud, that again and again and again they were disobedient, they grumbled and they complained, turning their backs on the true God. So now we find Aaron and Miriam in numbers, and, and they begin to, uh, they're complaining. They're upset because Moses married a Cushite woman. He married a woman named Zipporah, who was a Cushite. But see, when God heard their complaint, they, they were kind of jealous. And, and they says, it says in numbers, you know, they're saying, well, doesn't God, why is Moses so great? Doesn't God speak to, through us as well? But see, God hears their complaint, and he calls them out on it. He calls them and tells them that, that Moses, here, I'm going to read it. It says, then Miriam, and, and this is in Numbers chapter 12, then Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married. For he had married an Ethiopian woman. So they said, has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? 
Has he not spoken through us also? And the Lord heard him. Now the man Moses was very humble, more than all the men who were on the face of the earth. And suddenly the Lord said to Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, come out, you three, to the tabernacle of meeting. So the three came out. Then the Lord came down in the pillar of cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam. And they both went forward. Then he said, hear now my words. This is God speaking. them. God says, hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak to him in a dream. God would address his prophets through visions and dreams. But look at verse 7 of Numbers chapter 12. It says, not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. There's that language there that we see in Hebrews. He is faithful in all my house. But notice how the Lord speaks to Moses. Unlike the other prophets who he he appears through visions and dreams, he speaks to Moses. He says, I speak with him face to face, even plainly, and not in dark sayings. And he sees the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant, Moses? See, in their arrogance, they began to speak against the messenger of God. And like I said, Moses was a big deal. God had chosen him to be the one to deliver his people, to walk them through the wilderness, to deliver them into the promised land. And there was, in in a sense, them complaining against Moses was them complaining against God. So now we turn back to Hebrews, and this, in the same way, we begin to see the comparison of Moses' faithfulness. This man who was born an Israelite, he, he did everything that the Lord told him, uh, most of what the Lord told him until he didn't, and then he couldn't go see the promised land. We know how that ended up with him. But it's because of that kind of stuff that we also know that Jesus was a greater prophet. If Moses was a greater prophet than all the other prophets because God spoke directly to him face to face and not through dreams and visions, how much greater is the Son of God who was sent by the Father, who was one with the Father in heaven prior to coming to this earth. See, the Son of God is in direct relationship with the Father. He doesn't need to be spoken to through dreams and visions because they are of one will. The Father is in me and I am in the Father. We are of one will. Jesus again and again and again affirmed being one with the Father. So if Moses was this faithful servant, how much greater was the Son of God who willingly submitted himself to the will of the Father to the point where he left his place in heaven and made himself lower, like us, lower than the angels, just for a time, but lower than the angels. He not only made himself like us, but he submitted himself to live a life of service to the God, to the Father's will through his ministry. And not only that, but he, he, he submitted himself to the Father's will by submitting himself and being obedient even unto death. The pain, the suffering, the things that Jesus Christ experienced all on our behalf is astounding. It's hard to imagine suffering so greatly for somebody else. Now, I know having being married and having two beautiful little girls that I, I, I like to think that I would suffer for those girls, all three of them, to the point of death. But now, complete strangers, they are known to... Go, Jesus knew the strangers. They weren't strangers to him because he knew them. He knows us. He knows us intimately. But we are strangers to him because we did not know him. We did not love him. We weren't his brothers and sisters until after he had died for us. 
But even then, he was willing to submit himself to the will of the Father, even unto death. So we see here that this is the one, for this one, in, ver in Hebrews verse 3, it says, For this one, that is Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son, has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who built the house has more honor than the house. For every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. Now, I, I find this really interesting, and it really brought to picture um, to my mind. I, it made me think about a lot of modern art. I don't know if you've ever, has anyone ever been to um, any, or really any contemporary art museum, and you see some of these modern art pieces that apparently sell for a ton of money, and you're just like, Everly finger painted something like that last week, and I don't, I don't understand why is it worth, why is it worth a million dollars when this guy paints it, but when, when my, when my two-year-old paints it, it's just, yeah, it goes on the fridge until the dogs eat it. <laughs> but what we know, what really gives these painting values, isn't really necessarily the technique and the skill and blah 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 blah, whatever, but it's usually the artist. See, when an artist becomes so well-known, so renowned, that there becomes this intrinsic value, especially if, if the artist uh, was, was well-known and passes away. And then all of a sudden their collection of art becomes super expensive. It's given all this value and it's worth all this money because the artist had passed away. And it could be the worst painting you'd ever seen, but still it was worth $500,000, and it's all because of the value that was given to it by the artist. See, now, and, and this is what made me, and I think of that because now we begin to see uh, here in verse 3, it says, the one that has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who built the house has more honor than the house. Do so you see what that's saying? See, it's saying that the house of God, see, Moses was a part of the house of God. He was a member of God's family, but he wasn't the one who owns the house. He didn't build the house, but Christ did. Christ is greater because he is the one who built the house, the one who purchased his church with his own blood. See, the people before Jesus' time and during Jesus' time, they knew that there would be one like Moses. Moses himself had prophesied in the Old Testament that God would send one like him, but greater. And during the, in Acts, there's two examples of when Peter is preaching at Solomon's portico he says, this was in Acts chapter 3, and it says, but those things, this is Peter speaking, he says, but those things which God foretold by the mouth of all his prophets that the Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send Jesus Christ who was preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. For Moses truly said to the Father, for Moses truly said to the fathers, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him, shall you, him you shall hear in all things, whatever he says to you. And it shall be that every soul who will not hear that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. Jesus is greater prophet. Jesus is greater than Moses. It's, and it's because he was the one who built the house. He was prophesied for in, in the Old Testament but he's not part of the house. He's the foundation and he is the builder. He's the rock on which we stand. Christ's church stands on Jesus Christ as our foundation. Stephen, during his last moments, he said something likewise. 
to, to, the, to the rulers. He told them that, that, that God had promised the greater prophet. And he was saying God sent that greater prophet in, the, in Jesus Christ, the only begotten son. So as we see this comparison, verse 1 and 2 of, of this chapter, can, we see a similar comparison of Jesus and Moses. In verse 3, we begin to see how they are contrasted. And it's, it's seen through a simple question. What is greater, the creator or the creation? If God is the one who built the house, is the house better than the God who built it? See, we know that we are God's church, the body of Christ. But which is greater, God or his church? Christ or his body? Moses was only part of the house but God was the one who built it. And as we saw back in chapter one of Hebrews, we saw how Jesus was instrumental in the creation of all things, that all things were created in him and through him and by him, that his throne would reign forever. Your throne, O God, of the Son, the Father says, your throne, O God, will still last forever and ever and ever. That Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as God, created the house of God. Christ, as son, is over his own house. And we see similar things, these similar ideas in the book of Acts. Paul is speaking. He says, therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to, separate, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Christ purchased his house. He built his house. In 1 Corinthians 3.16, Paul writes, Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? See, we are the creation and God is the creator. We are the creation and Christ was created. We were created through the word of God, the word made flesh. And it's because of that, that as we continue on here in verse 5, it says, And Moses indeed was faithful in his house, house as a servant for for a testimony of those things which would be spoken afterward, but Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are if we hold fast the confidence in the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. If we hold fast the trust, confidence, confide, with faith, that's what it means. That's the, the, the Latin breaks out into confide, with faith. If we hold the faith in our Father in heaven through Jesus Christ the Son till the end, we are a part of that house. Now, it's interesting here because there, there's a bit of a conditional statement there. It says, if we hold fast the confidence. Now, there, there's a lot that can be said on this topic of, of what does it mean? Can we lose our faith? Can we lose our trust in God? Can we lose that salvation? Now, I'm going to say no, because God gave us to Jesus Christ, and he holds our lives in his hands. But the parable of the sower also tells us that there were this that there were the seeds that received the word with joy, but as they began to spring up, were choked out. They were scorched by the sun because the root was not deep. There was no root system to give them the nourishment that they needed. And I think that we see a lot of that in the church, in, in, in modern Christianity sometimes, that we see these people that may have grown up in church that, that, that had every intention to be to be a follower of Jesus Christ, but they never truly committed their lives to Christ. John writes in his epistle, he talks about those that, 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 that had gone out from us. They were not, the ones that had gone out from us were never part of us to begin with. It's because they had never truly devoted themselves to the Lord in their hearts. They had not set apart the Lord in their heart. Day and day. That doesn't mean it's a continual thing, but 
our life should reflect that. Now, this is, this is, this is, this is going to be a little tough maybe, but it's not that we every day are accepting Christ into our hearts. We accept and confess Christ as the Lord of our life, and because he is the Lord of our life, we then continue onward living our life as Lord, as Jesus Christ as Lord of our life. It is the practical outwork of our confession and our belief. And I think sometimes people confess and don't hold the belief. They receive the word with joy, but have no root, and therefore they dry up and they're scorched. They don't have the nourishment, and they, that relationship with Christ never truly grows. It never becomes fruitful. But I love it because if we hold fast to confidence, if we have that faith, and I believe that if you truly believe in God and Jesus Christ is the Lord of your life, you cannot lose that salvation. You don't have to sweat it. And oftentimes I think that the people that really fret over it, I sometimes want to just tell them, I say, the fact that you're so worried about losing it makes me feel like, one, either you're okay because you're so worried about your salvation that you're always focusing on, or two, you need to just trust in God and have confidence in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Because when you have that trust and you have that faith and you have that confidence, what does Hebrews tell us? We have the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. We already know how it's going to end. We know that Jesus Christ is Lord and all will be given to him and all will be put under his feet. He has authority over all things. God wins, ladies and gentlemen. That's the headline of today. God wins. There's no escaping. You can give the Lord a hand clap. That's that's fine. There's no escaping that. We will never escape that. But my question to you is, do you have the rejoicing of that confidence, that promise of that hope? Or are you going to be one of the ones that's defeated? I've said it before and I'll say it again. And it's because God has given me a heart for the lost. There are two people, types of people. The one thing that they have in common is that they will all bow before the Lord. Every name Every nation will bow before the Lord. The question is, are you doing it willingly in love for our Lord? Or are you forced to take the knee? You will be brought under submission. There's no escaping it. There is no escaping it that one day we will all stand before our God and we will have to answer for all of our Thoughts, our words, our actions, the things that we do, the things that we say, how we treat other people, how we treat ourselves, how we treat our family, we are going to have to answer for it. But it's great because we have a hope as believers, as God's church, as his house, as his holy temple, because the spirit dwells within us. We are his house, his temple. We can hold fast to our confidence, our trust, our faith in him until the end, and we can hold it with rejoicing and hope that when the day of the Lord comes, we will be brought into his presence to live forever with him and not to be separated. Ladies and gentlemen, I I encourage you that if you are here today or if you are listening from home, That today is the day that you can be a part of the house of God. That you can come and join the family of God. And it's as simple as confessing with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believing that God raised him from the dead. See, we are all guilty of sin. We are all guilty of unbelief. And the wages of sin is death. But we know that the gift of God is what? Eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord, the foundation of our faith, the leader of our faith, 
the pioneer, the anchor of our soul. Join in the house of God today. Submit yourself in the same way that Jesus Christ submitted himself even to death. Today is the day. Submit your life to God. Say, Lord, I've sinned. I've been rebellious. But today is the day that I'm making you Lord of my life. I'm setting you apart in my heart every day. Thank you, Jesus. I said it before, there's no secret ritual. There's no special prayer. That it is just going to the Lord in repentance and confessing him as Lord of your life. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we just thank you so much for your presence, for preserving your word, Lord. Lord, sometimes your word gives us truths that can be hard to swallow, Lord. It's hard for us to swallow, Lord, but we know that we can stand in confidence on the truth of your word. So, Lord, my prayer today is that we can continue to stand on the truth that we will have rejoicing in the hope that will be firm till the end because we can be children of God. Lord, I pray for anyone that's listening at home that has not made that commitment, Lord, that anyone that is here today that has not submitted themselves to you, Father God, that you will begin to work on their hearts even now, that they will submit themselves wholly to you, that they will confess their love for you today. I pray, Lord, that even now you will begin to work in their lives, forgive them of their sins, and show them what it means to have joy, to have peace, to be a partaker of the heavenly calling. Father God, I pray that you will continue to walk with us every single day that we can be worthy of the calling that you have given us. Holy in living sacrifices to you, Father. So if you're here today and you need prayer, if you are here today and you have not made that decision and you want to come forward during this hymn of invitation, I encourage you, come here, come up and pray. Maybe you've made that decision, but you've never stepped out in obedience and been baptized. Next week, we're going to be baptized and we have one person that is, that is being obedient to the Lord and is going to be baptized next week. And if you have not done that, I encourage you, come forward. If you want to do that, we will be here next week doing that. Perhaps there are things that are going on in your life, ways that you have, have neglected your hope neglected the truth of God's word. Today is the day to not let yourself drift away from that salvation that is so great and so glorious that we have in Jesus Christ. And this altar is open for you to pray here today. So please stand as we sing.